podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Thanks for tuning in. How are you out there in the world? You going for a run? You on a little drive? Sometimes I wish I knew what you were doing. I mean, why not? Shoot us an email. Let me know. Hey, Chris, here's who I am. Here's what's going on. Anyway, that might be creepy if I knew what all of you were doing, but you know what I'm doing, sitting here in our studio recording our 300-something-something interview and intro. And man, we've got a good one. You know why I love this show? It is the depth and the breadth. You know, too much in life is, is, is wide and shallow, but we get a chance to just cover so much and go deep. And today you're going to hear an episode on a topic we have never covered. What are the chances? Today, we're talking about something that is impacting people and children all around the world. It is almost seemingly an epidemic. People know a little bit about it to be dangerous, but not enough in my sense. And it can be scary. But with the right resources and information, it is something we can not only live with, but we can thrive with. And that is ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. On the show, we have Dr. James Lewis. Dr. Lewis is board certified in both pediatrics and the subspecialty of neurodevelopment disabilities. His clinical and research interest focuses on the treatment and prevention of school problems, ADHD, and behavior and learning problems. Here, and here's why, out of all the people on ADHD, Dr. Lewis is who I decided should be on our show to represent it. He finally brings to the forefront what I believe to be the best way to treat any chronic disorder, disease, issue, mental health, which is a patient and parent-centered approach. See, Dr. Lewis works mostly with children, and what he learned in his decades of experience is that although doctors have many of the answers— the parents are the ones with the depth of knowledge of their own children. And we need to work together with them. The doctor needs to sit down for an hour, two hours, just to understand what's going on. In this world of 15-minute appointments, how can you possibly come up with a treatment plan for something as complex as ADHD in 15 or 20 minutes? So it's a really unique approach, and Dr. Lewis outlines it in his brand new book, which basically comes out right now, probably when you're listening to it, that book is Making Sense of ADHD, Overcoming the Unique Challenges. Look, you might not be dealing with ADHD. You might not have a child who's dealing with ADHD, but almost certainly you know someone. It's a worry. Look, I'm a new parent. I worry about all the things that these little helpless children can be impacted by. And I just think if we can put one piece of information out into the world that helps people and parents and children find strength, find knowledge, find compassion, and find a resource that helps them, then we're doing our jobs. If you know anyone who's suffering from ADHD or, or even more aptly, as we talk about, if you know parents whose children are suffering from ADHD, please pass this along or at a minimum, provide them with Dr. Lewis's information and his book, Making Sense of ADHD which talks about the parent-centered approach. That's all I have for you, my passionate plea. I hope you really enjoy this. Here it is, our episode with Dr. James Lewis, as we talk about the epidemic and treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Enjoy. Well, Dr. Lewis, first, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. I'm glad to be here. You know, we were just talking and you said, you know, hey, Chris, I'm, I'm new to this world of podcasting. I'm excited, but uh, but I'm not new to the idea of talking with parents and talking with others about the impacts of everything from ADHD to chronic disease. And I feel like it's a great place to start. I'm hoping this episode is really allowing us to be maybe a fly on the wall or an observer 
in the hundreds and hundreds of conversations you've had over the years with parents and patients on life altering illnesses. Tell us a little bit about what has brought you to this point of where you sit down and actually spend time with patients of ADHD and chronic illness. Well, when I got into medicine, I decided to um, go into family practice because I like the idea about taking care of families and uh, long-term problems, and uh, it seemed exciting. When I got into it, I found out that what I really preferred was the kids. They were a lot more fun, and it was still a comprehensive continuum. You had to work with families, but you could kind of concentrate uh, on kids, and it was just much more enjoyable, and kids tend to get better, which was good. And I was training, and I spent some time as the chief resident in pediatrics. At that time, uh, it meant that I had a lot of responsibility in the intensive care unit. And I became very interested in that because of the challenge of it. Uh, but it got to be um, so far removed from actually working with patients. I was looking at a chart one day, and the parents uh, and the nurses were talking to the baby like it was a baby. And to me, it was just numbers. And I said, that's getting too far. So I went back and decided to um, get some training um, in ambulatory pediatrics. And during that time, I had a lot more of experience with uh, school and behavior problems. At that time, a lot of pediatrics was changing, and we weren't seeing as much uh, infectious disease. So we were seeing more problems with behavior in adolescence. So I got involved in that and trained to get a little bit more at the University of Maryland, and then had an opportunity to, to, to come to West Virginia because um, I met a nurse from West Virginia, and one thing happened to another, and now we've been here for 30-some years. Um, and so when I came here, there was an opportunity for me um, to get involved in kids with school and behavior problems. And um, I was kind of the new man here. And I think when the offer came, um, all the other pediatricians stepped back and I was still there. So I got, got, wasn't sure it was a good area. But when I got into this, I found out that I really didn't know what to do because I hadn't had the training. So over time in talking to parents, um, I eventually found out that the best thing to do was um, to use my ICU approach and to sort of separate things out, find different experts, but to, but to put the parent in charge. In the ICU, I'd listen to the experts, but the point is that um, I would have to make the decisions because I knew the whole story. And I found that parents knew the whole story, and parents could also help me aim for specific goals because the problem with behavior problems is that I don't have a way to actually measure it. So it really depends on the parents uh, explaining where the problem is and then coming up with solutions. So over time, as I talked to parents, I began to find out that I could give them a framework for their stories and begin to think about, the, at least think about ADHD, educational problems, behavior problems, and to focus on their goals. So every day I have the opportunity to talk to parents that are having a hard time finding their way. And we have about an hour and a half to talk to the, to, to the child, to examine them, to talk to parents, kind of show them um, a way that they can find their answers to these and then come back and talk about treatment. And so it really is centered on what parents, uh, what parents think the problem is and to give them options so they can decide how best to manage the kids because no one else knows the child as well as they do are committed yeah. to help them. So yeah. it's, it, it's very enjoyable. For me. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really struck me about your approach that we'll definitely get into. But it was this parent centered approach. It was 90 minutes in a world of 15 minute diagnoses. And many of the listeners know my story. But when I was in my early 20s, uh, I experienced something I never experienced before. Thought it was a heart attack. Went to the ER. Uh, doctors. I went to about seven different specialists and no one diagnosed me. And guess who figured it out? Guess who solved the riddle? It was my mom, literally with just the internet, because she's known me since I came into this world. Right. And, and so when I heard this idea of, you know, you take your expertise, but really leverage the internal dynamics, the expertise of the family and the parents, that's what leads you and them to the, maybe not necessarily solution, but proper steps and proper approach. I thought that was unique. Well, the problem that we face, particularly with behavior problems, is that doctors uh, in particular are somewhat limited in being certain of a diagnosis because usually we use history um, and physical and lab work to come up with what we think is the best diagnosis. Then we can talk about treatment and then we can monitor outcomes. 
But the problem for us with behavioral diagnosis in terms of making the diagnosis or monitoring our treatment is that we don't have any physical findings or lab work to help us. At some point, there may be because diagnostic strategies are beginning better and better as we look at some of the genes that may be involved in measuring neurotransmitters in the brain. So the first, in order to make the diagnosis, in order to monitor treatment, I need to have parents help me sort things out in terms of decreasing the uncertainty by getting a strong history and then uh, de deciding on, on treatment options to measure the outcomes because the outcomes are not a change in your blood pressure or a certain blood level or a brain scan. Right. It's more that the parents tell me this is where he should be. He is reaching his potential. And we look at grades and we look at relationships and self-esteem. So there's no way to be successful without showing parents how to do this in terms of making the diagnosis or finding your way through the complexity and finding where the problem is and then measuring success. So there's no way to do this without talking to parents. I never thought of the fact that in some illnesses, it's very clearly defined by a marker or a blood test. But in these behavioral right. issues, there's no way around it. I think a lot of the issues I've seen in my own medical journeys is that a lot of doctors, given their experience, their school, their expertise, they don't want to listen to either the patient or the parent. They don't have time. They have insurance issues to deal with. And oh, by the way, most patients go search on the Internet and then come back and say, here's why I'm dying. So I find that that willingness to listen has been decreasing over time. Do you notice the same thing? And what kind of allowed you to step out of that paradigm? Well, one thing is that being a pediatrician, uh, we talk to parents and we talk to kids. And that's kind of the fun of pediatrics. Mm. When I sort of got interested in pediatrics, I really enjoyed talking to the kids. They, they're funny. They tell you things. And it's just enjoyable to have conversation. So, so I always start with that. Every time I see the patient, I tell the parents, um, we're going to have a discussion, but the most important person in the room is the child because this is about them and they're going to have to sort this out. And I really want to hear from them because they also will help me sort this out. So we begin talking to them. And then when I talk to the parents, um, because I tell them, you, you're, and, I, and when they come back to see me, parents know I'm going to talk to the child first and then let them fill in because that's going to help me. And when I ask the parents, uh, I want you to just tell me, how did this start? and sort of listen to their description of when the things began, what happened at home, what happened at school, uh, how does he relate to the other kids, how are his grades, those kinds of things. So, so and, and not only does it give me good information, but then I can tell parents, now we need to organize this, and I show them kind of medical problem solving, how we can put it together. But it's also helpful because, particularly in pediatrics, uh, when I first started, the fun was talking to the kids, and the parents would kind of um, – it kind of bothered me because they're asking all these questions and I'm having a fun time talking to the kids. <laughs> but eventually I discovered, particularly when I began to have kids, was that my five or ten minutes with the child doesn't count at all for the day after day after day that the parent. Mm. So I better become the parent's ally and talk to them and sort this out so that I can be a support person for them. Mm. So that was helpful. And then when I began to have kids, I became much more humble because I was pretty good about giving advice before I had kids. <laughs> and after that, when there was a problem and they weren't sleeping, I would say, you know, my child's having the same problem. What's working for you? So so I, I, it made me a lot more humble to yeah. try to listen. To this. And and the other thing is that they will find the best solutions. It isn't it, I don't I don't have, you know, the best way to sort things out, but I can help them. I know every parent I see, I say I can help you sort this out. And I can give you options. I can't guarantee that we can get you better, but I can get you to the point where you can figure out what's going on and decide what you want to do best. So I think, I think that's the help. It's why, it's why I wanted to get this written down because it does take a long time. Well, I, a visit, visit and a forty-five minute visit, but 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 I wanted to get this information out to parents because so many that I see are just lost and don't know how to even approach this problem. Yeah. And, you know, we'll mention it a number of times, but you're getting this information out in the book that you wrote, which is making sense of ADHD, overcoming the unique conditions and the complexity of coexisting conditions. And I want to really jump into the depths of ADHD. I mean, when I first came across your work, it was both the patient and parent centered approach mixed with this expertise in ADHD that made me want to talk to you because I realized we haven't covered this topic. And I feel like so many people know a little bit. 
you know, the knowledge is very wide and very shallow. And I was hoping to to go in and go deeper. So if we could start with just tell us from your experience and your opinion and the research and all that, what is at its basic level, what is ADHD? So ADHD is uh, like a, like whether we can call it a behavior disorder, a psychological psychiatric condition. Um, so the issue for this is that the most of the research says that there's two aspects. One is an internal. In other words, these are the genetic basis. We know that there's family history for anxiety, for reading difficulties, and for ADHD. ADHD currently is more strongly inherited than height is. And we're beginning to look at some of the genes and understand that, but it's, it's, it's complicated. The other thing is that, of course, what we know now is that there's also an external component. So you may be inherit a tendency, but then different things in the environment may turn it on or make it worse. So sometimes if children, we know particularly in the first year or so of life, if they have what we call adverse childhood experiences, um, some studies have been done for a long time, if they're not if they're stressed and not able to, uh, not, not nurtured, they're unable to, for their brain to make the connections they need. And they get stuck at a very basic level of uh, fight, flight, or, or free, flee. And so it's very difficult to turn that around. And we know as well that during pregnancy, sometimes the problems with alcohol, tobacco, lack of care uh, can add to, these, to the problems as well. But what we're looking for is uh, a number of symptoms for, to make a diagnosis. So for any, any psychiatric psychological disorder, there has to be specific criteria. For ADHD, there's four. Um, one, well, there's, there's actually three, which is inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And we have to document that those conditions have been present over a long period of time, occur in more than one setting, at least school and home, are different than their peers. And then lastly, they actually cause impairment. So the other words that you can have symptoms, but it's the outcome that makes a difference. So we're looking at diagnosing and working on the symptoms of inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. But in the long run, what we're really trying to fix is what happens. Because of those things, there's interference. And the problem is that the impairment, and parents will tell me, the reason they come to see me is because the child is not where they should be. Mm. And what they mean by that is their grades are not at their full potential. Their effort is not being rewarded at school. They're discouraged. And then they have trouble with relationships. And these are relationships with family, relationships with peers. And lastly, and maybe more importantly, the relationships with themselves. So it goes back to self-esteem, self-confidence, their happiness, which is critical for parents. So that, that's, that's, that's the basic point of how we sort of go through this to make the diagnosis. At least we need to see those, those behaviors. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad we covered that. And here's why. I mean, as I've mentioned, I have a three and a half year old. And one of the things I have wondered for a long time about ADHD is the behaviors really define to me a child. I mean, especially a boy. Like when I read it, it was difficulty staying focused. Check. Difficulty paying attention. Check. Difficulty controlling behavior. Check. Hyperactivity. But, you know, I was like, this is just a three and a half year old boy. But what you just described is much more than that. The idea of different settings, the outcome is impacted. Those are what seemingly differentiate the standard behavior from the potential formal diagnosis of ADHD. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing about anxiety. We all have some anxiety and we should have anxiety because it makes us double check and make sure we can cross the street and, you know, make sure their car is locked. Um, and a little anxiety is helpful, but if the anxiety is so severe or so persistent that interferes, uh, then we have to do something about it. Now, I had a patient, and she had a fear of sharks, which was probably reasonable, but her fear of sharks was sharks in her bathtub. Now, she knew that this was ridiculous, but it impaired her so that she couldn't take a bath, so that she was always worried about this, couldn't sleep, uh, couldn't keep up with her schoolwork, and decided to not. So it was the impairment issue that caused the problem and the severity of it. So it goes back to looking at the difference between symptoms and then outcomes, because everybody has some of these symptoms at some point, but it's more when they occur over a long period of time, multiple settings, and impair them. And this is why I see them in kindergarten when they can't sit still. Right. I see them third grade because the inattentiveness and they start to fall apart in high school and middle school. I had to treat my son in third grade because I knew he had the ability, but we'd done all the behavioral and educational strategies. But at that point, his grades began to fall and I knew he should be able to do that. And he became much more upset about all the things, which wasn't his personality. 
So then we had to do some things and turn things around for him. I see. And as you mentioned, you know, your son, you, you had to take, go into treatment at, at uh, third grade. Sometimes I wonder, and I'm interested, especially from your firsthand perspective, is there ever a thought or is there any science or in your experience behind this idea that, look, yes, maybe they might have something that causes them to not perform in the formal school setting. However, just because it doesn't adhere to societal standards doesn't mean it needs to be fixed. D d is that ever a thought? Is that a concern with diagnosing this thing? Like you can't sit in a circle at five years old. Here's your problem. Where in reality, maybe you just shouldn't be sitting in a circle for an hour. Right, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, it goes back to um, the expectations in the environment. Now, what is so what's often valued in schools is people who can sit still and memorize things. Now, that worked for me because I went to medical school, so I was happy about that. But it doesn't mean that, that those other things shouldn't be worked through. Now, what's happening in the last 10 or 20 years, there has been a mini revolution in, in, in schools and education so that there now is a lot more strategies, not just for working with kids that have educational problems like learning disabilities, organizational problems, that type of thing, but also working with kids that have a lot of energy. And so they have ways that they can move, they do more exercising, they have uh, tables that work. So there's, there's a lot of interest, I think, in looking at that and saying, yeah, how can we uh, establish uh, at least the flexibility within the educational system? Now, this issue is more of a concern when we get into the relationship things because there may not be that much flexibility in fitting in as a teenager or particularly in jobs. So this is, again, where, where we have to sort this through because some kids that don't do well in school may be wonderful entrepreneurs, ideas and suggestions, and we don't want to suppress or push that out of their systems because I think that's the value of these kids. The idea about the, treating these kids is not to change them or turn them into zombies, but just to allow them to actually be themselves so they can get through these things and find their path. The other thing I was wondering as we set this foundation of ADHD is, first of all, what is the believed prevalence of this disease? And then is it increasing? Because at least, again, in my fairly small understanding, it seems like we continue to hear about it. More and more people have it, especially more and more um, prescriptions and prescribing drugs to deal with it. So I'm curious uh, what the numbers are and if they are, in fact, increasing. Yeah, again, it goes back to the difficulty of making the diagnosis, because if we're going to count on the number of cases of high blood pressure, we can go to doctor's office and measure blood pressures and said, yeah, Here's 100 of my 1,000 patients whose blood pressure is up. The problem for ADHD is that how do you make the diagnosis? So in some of the studies, the research is saying, uh, we're going to review records of 100,000 patients uh, in the National Health Services and found out how many were diagnosed. The question for me is how was it diagnosed? Because you have to get information um, over, as I said, for these, these symptoms that have occurred. You have to use checklists to make sure that these different criteria are met. It takes questionnaires from both parents and teachers so that you can compare these values to other kids their age and then talk about um, other impairments because other impairments may be, along with the ADHD, uh, difficult personalities. It may be anger issues. It may be anxiety. It may be learning problems. So all those other factors uh, play a part. So sometimes it's difficult to be sure of the diagnosis. Now, in medicine in general, the whole point of medicine is early diagnosis. We're trying to do a much better job in terms of screening people to look for cancer, to look for high blood pressure, heart disease, to prevent those things. So hopefully we're getting better at those things. At the same time, we, our diagnosis 20 years ago was kids that had severe problems because nothing was done. And now we're trying to look earlier on and saying, you know, can we, can we sort this out a little bit sooner so that we can intervene? Not necessarily medically, but certainly your point about educational strategies or behavioral strategies. So there's definitely there's definitely been an increase. Now, are we better at diagnosing? Is there more of it? There's questions about diet, about television, and you know, all the other different forces. I think that, you know, the, the opioid epidemic, and there certainly are reasons why we're seeing more of it, I think. But I think, I think we're making an earlier diagnosis, and we're much more aware of milder cases. When I first started, the patients I had were teenagers. They had usually failed um, they were often, unfortunately, uh, in substance abuse. And uh, at that point, the way we measured success in our treatment was to see if we could prolong the amount of time before they interacted with the police. And now I think we're a lot better about those things. Wow. But yes, 
for sure. That's a really interesting measure of success. And I can understand what you're saying and the progress that's been made. You know, you briefly touched on some of the hot buttons that I think it would be great to at least get your opinion on. Are there things that parents are doing to cause things like ADHD? Um, you know, as a parent of young kids myself, I always wonder, oh man, is this screen time going to cause them to lose the ability to focus? You know, do, how many books do I have to read in order to make sure that they learn this? And all these things that parents are beating themselves up over, some of them rightfully so, uh, do we see any direct link between parents' actions and the outcomes? And I'm talking of diagnosable behavioral disorders. Well, you can see how difficult a study this would be, sure. given the different personalities and, 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 and parents and IQs and social settings. I think, you know, one of the biggest issues for us um, in terms of what's causing this is more social concerns. It's about nutrition. Um, it's about poverty. It's about uh, the amount of attention parents can provide when they're working two jobs and sharing apartments with other parents and having a difficult community outside that doesn't support and, and risk for the kids. So I think a lot is to be said for healthy nutrition, good sleep patterns, uh, working with the schools, preventing um, um, teenage pregnancy and making sure that, that those are taken care of. There's studies that try to look at television, that try to look at video games. I think it's very difficult. What's really clear is this is a strongly inherited problem. So the experience I had with twins, not identical, one has ADHD, one doesn't, and how different they were. And despite all the things that I could do, uh, I had no problems with the other one. And the other one, I must have been a terrible parent because I couldn't get anything things better. And finally, it dawned on me that, yeah, this is a medical issue. I think the other thing is that it's really hard for parents who do not have kids with ADHD to understand this because – when parents with children with ADHD explain how difficult it is and how things, it's like it's like trying to get rid of fevers without Tylenol. You just can't get anywhere. It's very frustrating to everybody. So there's a lot of guilt for parents with, AD, with kids with ADHD. But the point, what I'm trying to get them is that there is help for this. There's ways for them to sort this out. And that concern and commitment when it's turned in ways to help the kids rather than wasting time uh, with with uh, uh, in, in losing emotional energy with self-blame for these things is, is not what we need. I need to encourage parents to find their way through this and see success. Yeah. And you touched on the two things that I really wanted to make sure we covered, which is one is treatment. And then two is that that feeling of guilt and responsibility that parents have can have. Again, things that what's crazy about this is as a kid, and I don't even mean like when I was young, but until I was a parent myself, I never blamed my parents for any of my illnesses or, you know, oh, I got a bad back. It's your fault. But then when you're a parent, it very quickly, at least for me, was like, what did I give them that I that I worry about their their growth, their life, their development, et cetera. So. Let's start with this idea of that parent responsibility, that guilt, and then that denial. What do you see happens often in your offices when, when parents come in? What do they say? And then how do you recommend they deal with it? Well, one thing in terms of the parents, and I try to have both of them come in at the same time, uh, because it's really helpful to be able to listen to both of them uh, so that um, we have a perspective from both mother and father. And also, when I try to talk to them about how to organize their thoughts, again, different parts of what I describe may resonate with them, and whether it's a problem with sports or a problem at home or school, um, because um, parents have such a, a, a different perspective. I think it's very valuable for kids to have that, because moms tend to explain things and try to be a more calming person, where dads say, uh, this is the end of it. There's going to be you have to hit you have to hit these things and this is so it's it's just sort of a different different approach uh, given given you know just the values of in personality and what they're like so so i will often hear um from fathers um that uh they just said he's just a boy those kinds of things so so i think that's that's kind of the perspective i get is from trying to say the person that is with this child the most is probably going to see the problem because the child is smart enough to know how to work this and change those buttons and make things happen. So the parent feels, and oh, the dad says she's not, this is, happens in divorces as well, that the, this mother is not strict enough, that she has a, a, a lifestyle that isn't good. And so there's a lot of criticism towards the parents. And I try to say, you know, the pro, this is the child's problem. 
this is something we need to work together to find out how to help them. Now, you make different approaches, but we want to be as consistent as we can because the problem with ADHD kids is they need consistency because they have they have so much trouble self-regulating that they prefer a world that's very strict and, and, and strong and in place for them. So so it works better for them. But the, but, the, but the problem for fathers is that the system doesn't work because they're not able to respond to the discipline. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So there's a difference in, in parents, I think, in, in terms of how they look at the problem. I think the other thing for fathers is they often see themselves in the child. And you may have this experience as a father. When you see yourself in your child, you sort of know where they got it, and you want, don't want to think that they don't have to go through that because you've had a hard time with it. So mm. the best thing is just to deny it, and denial works for a while, but eventually it doesn't. And when dads see this and say, boy, he's really doing well, it was a good decision to take the medicine. I'm so proud of how well he's doing. So now you can be a resource because you have gone through this and found your way through it, too. Imagine I'm a father. I come in, and you know I kind of confide in you where you sense the guilt do you have any strategies over the years to help them feel like, look, this is part of life. We all have things that we inherit that are good and bad uh, to help anyone out there listening who might feel the same way or at some point in their life feel this way? Well, the whole purpose for me getting together with parents is to show them an action plan to say we have to move past this. OK, because mm. now we need to find out what's going to fix this guy. So I want to put your time, your energy, uh, your thinking into what's going on. Because I talked to parents about saying the first problem is, is the uncertainty of making the diagnosis, but the second is looking at the complexity. Because I'm gonna need their help to sort out what else is going on with the child. Because kids with ADHD often have learning problems, they have organizational problems, they have trouble reading, getting their thoughts on paper. Uh, and, problem, and also, they have emotional problems. So kids with ADHD have a much higher percentage of anxiety, they tend to have what the psychiatrists call opposition defiant disorder, which I just call sensitive, stubborn personalities. <laughs> They're kind of along with, you know, if we all know someone like that. And then, uh, and then the family situation, because the, there's external and internal influences. In the past, I've worked real hard with medicine, with school, having counselors, and finally things wouldn't get better. And I kind of gave more medicine, worked with the schools. And finally, parents told me, you know, the problem here is what we tried to tell you six months ago, not medicine or school, but grandmother got sick and had to live with us. We had to move finances. So so that's that's a big one. I just saw a patient yesterday, and he came in with his grandmother, and he was having some problems. Now, he's on the right dose of medicine, so I was kind of confused. He was kind of angry toward the grandmother and kind of spoke sharply to her. Um, and I was trying to look at his medicine. I realized, well, he's in middle school. This is a shift. Well, as we had the time to talk, she said, oh, by the way, I'm so proud of how help, how much he's helping his mother. She's not here today because her rheumatoid arthritis has flared up. And so she's in bed a lot. So he has to help a lot. And she's really couldn't come in today because of her absence is causing some trouble. And the uncle moved in. His uncle is 20 years old and he's had to move into this guy's as well, and which is kind of a stress because he's there because he is having some problems with the opioid epidemic that we're having in town. And so we talked some more and began to think more about things. And finally, so I began to say, you know, I don't think this is a need for a change in medication. I think we need to go ahead because mom was receiving counseling. I said, well, let's open that up to the family. Let's work with the school and sort of reevaluate the medications. So so it's, it's really it's really listening to the story and getting them to work on it. And, and that's something that I don't think enough enough doctors do. And it's not necessarily their fault in this day and age. I wanted to talk about, actually, as you mentioned, medications and ways to treat it. What is your approach to treatment? I know in, in reading up on you, it's, it's definitely not let's start with medication and drug them up. So if you could walk us through how you go from diagnosis uh, to kind of honing in that treatment plan, what's that process look like for you? Well, after we've sort of given the parents the context and we talk about using medical problem solving, which is uh, coming up with a chief complaint, doing a hist asking questions, doing a history, doing a physical exam, lab work. Uh, we don't have much physical or lab work and coming up with a differential diagnosis and then going ahead and, and trying the different treatments. So it comes down to saying we have to think about three components, which is the medical aspect, the educational aspect, and the behavioral aspect. Usually parents have worked hard on the educational and behavioral aspects. Sometimes the school needs to do more. Sometimes they need to have educational testing. The children that are having problems in school, particularly ADHD, have a right to modifications. And these are through different pathways at the school. They have student assistant teams, 504 plans, individualized educational programs. So we need to do those things. And then I say, you know, we've done everything we can to be sure of the diagnosis. We need to talk about treatment. And one of the options is medication. 
So the issue about treating these kids, remember that we've talked with the parents, um, examined the child, talked to the child. We've collected information. I use um, questionnaires. They're called Connors questionnaires and Vanderbilt questionnaires from parents and teachers. I have a teacher narrative and a rating scale that they tell me about how things are going. And then when they come back, we discuss, again, behavioral educational approaches and work on that first. As I said, the schools are getting much better at this, and usually parents are doing those. However, sometimes I will refer them for counseling to help with this behavior modification, and sometimes we will work with the schools to do more testing and to come up with a better plan to help them at school. But then the question comes about medication. So we spend quite a bit of time talking about medication because parents have to be informed about the medication because I am going to depend on their comments on whether it's working or not, as well as if they're having side effects. If I'm treating a patient in the hospital, I depend on the nurses or the staff to tell me things, but this is all up to the patient, the parents, and the teachers. So what we do is we talk about the medications, um, talk about the pros and cons, give them a lot of handouts about the information, and I use these forms, Vanderbilt forms, which are for the parent and teacher, so week to week they can tell me if they're seeing improvement in the symptoms of attention and hyperactivity, in the outcomes, which are goals and relationships, or if they're seeing any side effects. And they call us week to week, and we take our time and move ahead. And usually we have to take our time to work through side effects and things like that. We see them back in a month and move ahead. The medicines almost always work, and when they do work, things change. I tell parents, it's like if you have a fever and I don't give you Tylenol, nothing seems to work. And plus you get a headache and a stiff neck. If I treat you with the Tylenol, things get better and a lot of those other things go away. There's still reasons for the fever. When the medication works, the child is on our side. They begin to help us. And the teachers say, yeah, he's focusing now. Let's work on the reading. And the behavior plans work because the kids can stop and think and make a better choice. So, But I leave it up to parents. And I said, this is what you, you have to decide if this is something you want to do or not. And when, they, when most parents will say, we think it is time, and I reassure them that this is a trial. If it doesn't work, we're going to stop the medicine. Sure. And I want to touch on the, med- the medicine um, for a minute here, because albeit I have a limited knowledge, it's my understanding that primarily it's just um, uppers. It's like amphetamines, right? It's, it's speed. Um, and so if, first of all, I don't know if that's true. So you can help me understand what medication gets prescribed for ADHD. And if that is the case, what mechanism allows something such as an amphetamine to help people who are already hyperactive or can't focus? Um, I'm just curious about how we medically treat a behavioral disorder such as this. So I want you to think about one thing, which is that there are actions and counteractions. So if you were in a speeding car and wanted to stop it, you would push your foot on the brake as hard as you can. It's the same thing about how these medicines can help. The problem, as best we understand it, is that there are neurotransmitters in the brain, and there's probably 50 that we know of. And it's the transfer of those transmitters from one cell to another that brings on emotion, personality, learning, We know that there are some families that have anxiety, tends to run in families. That's why some families worry about things, other families, nothing seems to bother them. What's the reason? Those parents, those families tend to have lower levels of serotonin. We know with ADHD, what lower levels are, are norepinephrine and dopamine. So these stimulants, medications, and these have been used in kids since the 1930s. Amphetamines were first given to children Mm. with ADHD symptoms uh, uh, almost 80 years ago. And the medicines worked wonderfully. And the reason they work is because they replace what's missing. So this is an idea of restoring to a balance, not to make a medicine that changes you or makes you different. If you have a strep throat, I will use penicillin. It's a wonderful antibiotic. It kills strep, but it's not supposed to be there. You have reactions. Kids with seizures, I have to slow down their brains. I mean, I'm trying to get rid of the seizure, but that's what I'm doing. That's not what these medicines do. When used correctly, what they do is they go back into the brain and allow the child to be himself in those settings that are hard for him. We're still going to work on those settings. If it doesn't do that or changes the child in any way that the parents don't like, we won't use it. Hmm. So amphetamines, although in some they they kind of cause the emotion of speed and stimulation, it really what we're doing in ADHD is acting on the neurotransmitters is to re, to replace norepinephrine essentially. Right, and these are these are in a group called psychostimulants. The the, the, the two stimulants are uh, the amphetamines, basically Adderall, and the other ones are the Ritalins. The Ritalins came out of the 1950s. 
there are different there are different medicines, although there's chemical similarities. Most children can respond to either one, so it just depends on. And if we have trouble with one, then we can switch to the other. We have now long-acting forms of the medicine, which has been a tremendous improvement because when we first started these medicines, they only lasted three or four hours, which meant we'd have to give a dose at home, a dose at school, a dose when they came home from school. It's very difficult to do that. There's a lot more side effects. And the biggest problem is that um, most people have trouble with the feeling of the medicine getting into their system and out of their system. So with the long acting medicine, it's been just a wonderful improvement because it's just once a day. It gets in smooth and really takes care of things. So that change has been very beneficial. Wow. Yeah, that is. It's always interesting kind of understanding, especially when you're dealing with children. You know, I know myself, I don't even want to give you know, my kid with a fever Tylenol, just because they're such tiny people, you know, and, and it, just the concern of, of putting drugs in their bodies. But as you as you kind of explain it, it's just bringing back to balance. And I'm sure you've seen as we've been using it for, like you said, 70, 80, 90 years, the results can be quite dramatic, I would imagine. And remember, parents have always have already tried everything. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. They're, it's like if you said she had the fever, but I put a fan, I gave him some light pajamas, I'm cooling her off, I'm giving her some cool water, I've got some cool compresses on, but I still cannot get this fever down. And it is getting worse, and she's getting a stiff neck, and I don't know what to do. We would say, let's try the Tylenol. So this is a decision for parents to make, but not until we've done a careful evaluation and we have tried appropriate educational behavioral strategies. So before we have to let you go, I know we only have a few minutes, I wanted to make sure we touched on why you included the complexity of coexisting conditions. Tell us what you mean when you discuss coexisting conditions and how they play a role in the cases that you see. Yeah, this is another thing that I've sort of learned from parents and to try, my, try to find my way through. So I think the themes of the book is that uh, can, parents can do this, but it is, it is uh, a problem with um, uh, uncertainty. And we also have to live with some of that. But the other problem is complexity. So my example is, um, if I was in the ICU with a really sick patient, maybe maybe a diabetic, I would say, there's a lot of things going on with this. And I would go back to chief complaints. So the biggest thing is that he's not talking to me. Well, when I used to work in the ICU, we had a wonderful neurologist. Her door was three doors down in the hospital. I'd go talk to her. And she would give me information about how to diagnose and treat that. And then see the cardiologist. I'd pull him in the room because of the problems that my patient was having with heart rate. But I would go back and write the orders. They're experts, but they only know one part of the puzzle. I know the whole puzzle. Parents know the whole puzzle. So parents are the ones that can do this, and they have to put the team together. Because the problem is that when you have ADHD, your chances of having other problems are there. Some of them may be because of the ADHD. In other words, if you're not paying attention to mathematics and you don't listen to uh, multiplication, you're not going to be able to do division. It's not that you have a. It's not that you have a math learning disability. It's that you weren't listening. I think the other thing is kids tend to rush through things because they're impulsive, so they don't take the time to read carefully, and they don't know the comprehension. But it's also true that there are real learning disabilities where people have trouble with reading, trouble with getting their thoughts on paper, organization, or executive function. So even though you treat that, you still have those problems. The other thing is that everybody has a different personality, and some kids are more anxious, and some kids are more sensitive and stubborn. If you have ADHD and you're not doing well and we're not keeping up the reading, you're going to get anxious and you might already have inherited a tendency towards anxiety. Uh. Kids with ADHD they have more trouble with tics. They have more trouble with constipation. They have more trouble uh, with other medical conditions. So the point is what I tell my residents and students and doctors is you don't need to worry about everything. You need to treat the ADHD and get under control. When my patient's really sick, I give them the Tylenol first and then I see what happens because what happens is a lot of things get better. I think the other thing about this is the beauty of the treatment is it gets the child on our side. Because we've been talking about parental involvement, but when the medicines work, particularly long acting, the kids know it's working. And they will tell me, this is a good medicine. It wears off. It's not too much. They the side effects. But the other thing is they help us make decisions. My example is, again, when I'm in the ICU and I've got five doctors, unfortunately, we might be all arguing at the bedside because we all have different opinions on what to do, the brain doctor, the heart doctor. When the patient wakes up, he listens to this conversation and says, that guy's wrong. That isn't what hurts. I didn't like this medicine. So in the long run, the kids are going to be important, which is why I talk to them. How, whatever their age, whatever grade they're in, how is it going on? What's happening to the medicine? What's happening at school? All that kind of stuff because they're the ones that can really tell. And that's why you know I feel so strongly 
about the value of the medicine because if it wasn't working, the kids wouldn't take it or the parents wouldn't. It makes a difference. And I think there's so many concerns now. And I have to spend so much time getting to the parents to the point that we can be sure at least to try them because it's like Tylenol. Tylenol always works. These <laughs> medicines make a difference. Yeah, that's so true. Well, for the parents out there listening who have found this so valuable, what would your last kind of short piece of wisdom be if they're if they're struggling with this? Maybe it's a new diagnosis or they've stagnated with their children and are unsure of what to do. How do they how do you give them comfort and then and then not just comfort, but recommendations on how to push through and keep going? So it's important to understand that this is going to be a big job and there are no shortcuts and they're going to have to take the time and effort energy to find their way through this. So the first thing is to educate themselves more. Uh, Chad, which is the, the the strongest parent support group, has a wonderful website, and they have resources for ADHD, and they will help parents educate themselves about the medication, about educational behavior. So there's some very, very good resources. So parents have to learn this because I ex- they're going to have to do this. But I think the other thing is you can they, they, there is help for this. There is no question that we can get these kids better and turn things around because sometimes parents are so desperate because the education behavioral things don't work. Everybody gets discouraged. The kids get demoralized. They stop trying after a while. So the point is parents can do this. It's not an easy job, but they need to kind of get the resources and they need to start recruiting and put together a team, which should be a medical person, an educational consultant, behavior person, and really clarify their goals in terms of grades, relationships, and work that we're toward this. But it can be done, and parents are the only ones who can really do it. Well, I appreciate all of your insight and your empowerment of parents. I love the message. Finally, turn it over to the people who are there the entire time and then work with them as a professional. Dr. Lewis, I, I can't say again how much I appreciate you being on the show. The book, which is brand new, it hasn't even come out, I, I don't think, as of this recording, is uh, Making Sense of ADHD, Overcoming the Unique Conditions and the Complexity of Coexisting Conditions. Before we go, I just wanted to ask you, where can people find the book? When does it come out? And anywhere else that our audience can learn more and read more about you and ADHD? Well, it should be out next week. Okay. Um, the, the Chad meeting is in St. Louis, and I'm going to have a chance to talk there. Um, it's published by High Tide Press, and it should be on Amazon or anywhere else like that. Okay, great. And is there anywhere else that you write or, or you know, want to plug while we're here? <laughs> I, I just appreciate the chance talking to you. It's Absolutely. Been, been and uh, I, I hope that the book, the reason I wrote the book was because I, I really think that there is, uh, parents just need a bit of a guidebook to find their way through it. They can do it, but, and so, uh, and I, it takes, because of the amount of time I have to spend, and although I've tried to do this in different ways, it's really a one-to-one thing working with parents. So I thought this might be a way to get it out so the parents can find their way through this. Because as I said, there is hope. They can they can find their way through this. Well, parents need all the help we can get. So again, Dr. Lewis, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time and best of luck with this great new book. Thank you very much. All right. Well, have a great day. Thanks so much. Nice talking to you. You as well. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Another interview in the books. Hope you enjoyed the episode with Dr. James Lewis, his book, Making Sense of ADHD and Overcoming the Challenges of Coexisting Conditions comes out very shortly and you can pre-order it now. Head over to cherryhillhightide.com, search for Making Sense of ADHD and you can find it there. Don't forget the easiest way to support Smart People Podcast is by using the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. If you do one thing after today's episode, I ask you to head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review for the show. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got a lot of great interviews coming up, so we will see you all next episode.